So I am so curious when I watch episode 16 of season one, you said you had already watched it and you don't feel as attached to it as you did with episode 15. So I feel like for me, that's like a good teaser. Like as we're recording this right now, we already finished our episode 15 recap and uh, we're going to go into episode 16 at some point. Um, but uh, I mean, do you, do you think I may like it or not like it? Like, what are you, what are you thinking How based on how you're feeling? I think that you'll like it. Um, there is some very funny, humorous moments that happen where I laughed, but I did not get attached to this episode the way I thought I was going to. It was more one of those episodes where I'm like, oh, hey, look at that person. We're going to see them again or that person there. Whoa, we're going to see this whole character development that we never would have thought. But for me, it just I just wasn't attached to it. It's going to be one of those ones in the grading system where I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, this is missing a very important part of this meal for me. You have sparked my curiosity, bummed me out, made me excited. You make me feel all sorts of things, Andrew. It's you're basically like what every visual artist wants their audience to feel. That is what I want. I want you to feel this. Y'all have to go watch this. Watch this episode before you listen to the recap of episode 16. And maybe you'll understand what I'm saying. And I'm saying that to everybody who listens. Watch the episode and then listen to the recap. So we are recording this on uh, Friday, March 22nd. I believe, what, 8 to 18 inches of snow expected here in Vermont from like tonight, you know, through most of the weekend. Well, what's it like for you in Rochester, New York? I can't see out my windows right now. The snow is literally blinding. So I don't even know what it's going to look like. And I have to go out of here in two hours to get to an appointment. I am not looking forward to that drive. So you already have snow because, I mean, for us, it doesn't start until like 8 p.m. tonight. It's it's pretty much dry out there right now. Uh, it has been snowing here since since this morning. So around, ooh, I want to say it was 9.30 is when it started with just flakes. And now it's just big, heavy snow just coming down. Well, uh, yeah, because of this snow uh, that's supposed to be happening tonight as we are uh, recording this. Um, yeah, I think we were originally supposed to record that episode 16 recap. So, you know, we're taking it safe. We're going to extend that to next week. Um, and this is the delicious recap, Family Matters. In case you're wondering what the hell we're talking about. I mean, if you were wondering, why are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Maybe you're an adventurous person who goes inside places that have signs that say, be careful and you don't read them. And that's how you ended up here. And it's okay. Yeah, you just kind of stumbled upon us accidentally when you meant to listen to Joe Rogan or sex with emily whatever podcast you listen to either way we're glad to have you accidentally or not accidentally i'm john francois i have no idea if you are going to be yourself or a character this week today i am aj vandertunt i am a caricature of andrew <laughs> wait so a caricature of so who's andrew and who's aj I, I thought they were the same person they are the same person today i'm just more animated as aj okay because you make it seem like some kind of clark kent superman thing where it's like oh aj likes grapes and andrew likes raisins that would be true if raisins were not disgusting <laughs> <laughs> andrew likes granola aj eats the grapes but yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of like a little Clark Kent situation because, you know, Clark Kent was a terrible person and did terrible things and then had behind a personality where you're like, oh, he's relatable. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, oh, my God, the Your Two Dads podcast that we were on to talk about the uh, the pop culture dadness between Carl Winslow and Superman. Listen to that with our good friend Corey Lewis, wherever you get podcasts. That, that was a great time. Fantastic time. Y'all have to listen. Yes. And uh, I think we were recording this. Uh, God, how fast time goes by. It's, uh, as we were recording this, it's been almost a week since we appeared at 90s Con in Connecticut, my home state, to uh, represent this dear Family Matters We Watch podcast of ours. And we decided instead of like making a brief opening chatter for an episode recap, let's devote an entire episode to talking about our first nostalgic convention and really our first public networking appearance on behalf of this podcast. Um, I know that my drive there wasn't as eventful as you yours. All I know, all I have to say about my drive going to the Connecticut Convention Center from my home in Vermont was that I did not expect it to be as long as it was. I thought 
because based on previous drives that it was like, oh, three hours and 45 minutes. But it turned out to be like four hours and eight minutes or four hours and 10 minutes. I was already running late because, of course, Andrew, we're black. That's what we do. And uh, yeah, I think I did, did, uh, actually started walking through the convention center, not until like 1030 when ideally I wanted to get there right at 10 with the convention started. I think you had mentioned that you were stopped at the you know on the way over to uh, the convention center from rochester i was so i had a quite an adventure just to get to getting on the road so i went to go pick up my rental car friday night when i got to the rental place they had no cars like not a single car to rent me so i was like well i already reserved my rental car online what am i supposed to do i'm like i've already done everything i'm just here to pick up the physical vehicle they had to drive to another rental agency halfway across rochester which took forever just to bring me the car to rent but thank goodness i have say this um they brought me a mitsubishi eclipse crossover i think is what it was what it's called and it was a cute car like i think when i get rid of my kia that's what i'm going to next because it was fantastic but now get to the day I actually get on the road. I wake up Sunday morning, not Sunday morning, oh my God, Saturday morning. It's 4 a.m. I get all packed and ready, load up the car, and I get on the road. And as I'm on the expressway, I don't realize that I am driving 95 miles an hour on <laughs> now, the 65 mile an hour throughway. Okay, so it's, oh, wow. I, I thought I was bad with my 20 mile over the speed limit routine, but you're going 30. That's a new thing. So is that because you were so anxious about getting there too late or was it because that's just how you naturally was, felt like driving that day? It was not anything about the convention or getting there late. I was just listening to, I want to say it was either Agora Hills by Doja Cat or I was listening to a Calvin Harris song. Whichever song it was, I was just singing along and bopping along and the car just drove so smoothly. I did not realize I was going as fast as I was going. I'm just in the left lane and I'm just like, oh, these people and I'm just passing people, not paying attention just singing along and then the next thing I know I look down and I'm like oh shit I have been going 95 miles this entire time and there's a cop behind me so of course I get pulled over wow and uh side note I think 86 by Green Day that's one of my songs because you know everybody has those specific songs where you could be going like 100 miles an hour like on the on the highway because that song just gets you pumped so my adrenaline driving over the speed limit song pretty much a lot of stuff by Green Day and I'm good to go so tell me, so tell me what happened, like when you got stopped by the cop, how did that interaction go? Because I know you haven't had many pleasant interactions with police in the past. I don't really care for the cops. Like, I mean, if you know me, I don't like the police. I really don't. Even after working for, with, not for, the police department, I still don't care for them that much. Um, but... Oh, and by the way, my song, now the song that I was driving to, I was like ripping it up, but Get Out of My Way by Kylie Minogue. I don't know why, but that song makes me want to just drive fast. So it just works. I mean, it's, it's, it says it all in the title. Get out of my damn way, five other cars in front of me on the road. I'm trying to drive 95. I don't care about the law. <laughs> yes, like move people. I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, But the cop was like, nice. He walks up and he's like, do you know why I pulled you over? I was like, no, because I wouldn't have stopped if I did. And that was me just being annoyed in that moment. But I was the one who was breaking the law. So he's like, well, you were speeding. I was like, oh, OK. I was like, well, I don't know how fast I was going. I'm lying at that point because I knew. And he's like, do you know how fast you were going? I was like, no, I don't know. And he says that he's like, well, I clashed you at 90 on my radar and it's a 65. And I was like. Oh my God, I had no idea this is a rental car and it just drives so smooth. And like I played fake shocked and it worked. <laughs> he did not give me a ticket. Wow. <laughs> Like, Andrew. he did not give me a ticket. Andrew, mm -hmm. you were able to use pretty white girl privilege on this cop as a black man? What? It, it worked. I played clueless, like, oh, my God, I have no idea. This is a new car. Like, and I'm just talking to him. And then he asked me, he's like, oh, so this is a rental car. You're not from Florida. I'm like, yes, this is a rental car. And he's like, so do you own a car? And this is how you normally drive? I'm like, no, I have a little Kia Forte. And I can barely get that thing over 40 miles an hour. And then we just kind of related on that subject of, okay, you're driving something new and fast. Okay, just keep it below the speed limit. 
and then he let me go. There you go. Oh my God. And and at this point, were you still in, in New York state or had you already gone to Connecticut? Like where were you at this point? I was still in New York state. If you're familiar with I-90 in New York state near Syracuse, that's where I was. Okay. Okay. And I feel like um, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, sort of that tri-state area, they, because I mean, how, 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 how is it possible to keep track of all the uh, super fast dick drivers on the road in the tri-state area. Uh, I mean, you know, I think pretty much anybody outside of the tri-state area, like we have that reputation of not being the most uh, considerate law-abiding drivers. So I I would expect that that cop letting you go was related to that sort of tri-state area driving leniency. That's what I really think because I can't tell you how many times I, as a person, even after I got pulled over, I went right back up to 95. I was not playing. Um, But I went right back up to speeding and I was the slow person. People are like flying past me and I'm still going 85, 90. And I'm like, wow, okay. So I guess I won't get in trouble again. And I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, When I used to live in the Midwest, God, I mean, you know, I I go five or 10 miles over and I'm getting stops, especially 20 miles over. I got stopped. I I, I had a lot of bad Connecticut driving habits that I took with me during my year and a half in Iowa. And then when I moved back to New England, but up north from Connecticut uh, in Vermont, where I am right now, um, it's pretty much the opposite. You know, even though it's still the same sort of relaxed relaxed rural territory as Iowa, Vermont, like the police haven't really stopped me much for speeding. I've, I've had many situations where I've gone 20 or maybe 30 in, in roads where I shouldn't have uh, gone that fast. And, you know, nope. And maybe their thing is like, eh, you know, we're a low traffic state. There's nobody around. It, what's the worst that could happen? So, It kind of just depends on where you are. And, um, you know, look, I mean, I guess the the bright side is that you got there safely. You got to 90s Con and we we met up. I did. I got to 90s Con safely. Just a tip for anybody who goes on road trips. If you leave in the morning, no matter what day it is, you can always say, I'm just late for work. And the cops typically are like, "Okay, just keep it below the speed limit. Everybody's head to work right now. Really? Because I would imagine that the cops are like, oh, my God, I've heard that excuse many times. Like plan ahead. If you think you're going to be late because of traffic, like leave an hour early. But no, you're you're saying that the cops are just like, all right, fine, whatever. Yeah. For the most part, they don't want to write the ticket because it takes longer to write the ticket than for you to get out of it. Wow. All right. So, you know, we finally arrived at 90s Con in uh, Hartford, Connecticut at the convention center. Um, I get there around 1030. Uh, My friend Courtney, also from Connecticut, uh, she uh, joined us and uh, she was the first one there because she is a white lady who understands being on time. And uh, she got an autograph and a selfie with Jason Marsden. Now, for you listening, if you don't know who Jason Marsden is, he's just one of those actors that prepped up on a lot of 90s shows and movies, but may not have enough star power where you think like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. You know him from somewhere, but you can't quite pin him out. Uh, he was Max in that Goofy movie. He was uh, Eric Matthews' friend for a while in Boy Meets World. Um, and Courtney, you know, I guess just was a big admirer of his work uh, because she was born, um, I think she's got maybe about a decade on me and she's maybe not too uh, far from age than you so she kind of really grew up in the 90s and she got an autograph and selfie with jason marston in a very small line uh probably the only small line that i really saw out of all the lines of you know where you get to take autographs and selfies with celebrities um and then uh yeah eventually all three of us you know you me and courtney we met up at the boy meets world q a panel Uh, with your Tito's drink, Andrew. Funny enough, before we got up to the panel for us to actually listen to everything, I got to the convention, I want to say it was like 1145. So there was like a good group of people already there. And I'm walking around the bottom floor trying to figure out where to go to get into the convention. And then I see this guy and I'm like, he looks familiar. I have no idea who he is. Like, who is this man? But I'm like, I know him from somewhere. Fine guy, like black man who looked amazing. 
one. So I was like already enamored. And I'm just like, I just know this man from somewhere. And I couldn't put my fingers on it. And the whole time it was a Lemmy Ballard from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the quiz master. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and we eventually see him at the Sabrina the Teenage Witch panel as well. Oh my God, that's mm-hmm. awesome. So you got, you got mm-hmm. that interaction with him. Did you ask for a picture or anything? Or was it just a brief fleeting thing? No, I didn't know who he was until we got to the panel. Because the mm-hmm. whole time I'm like, damn, he looks familiar. But then I didn't want to be weird and be like, oh my God, I know you from somewhere. So I just didn't say anything the whole time he was down there. And then once I finally got up to where y'all were and I looked at the program, I'm like, that is the man I saw downstairs. And I'm like, it's the quiz master. And it all hit me at once. So he was just kind of commiserating amongst the the, the, the public, the normal peasants. <laughs> he looked like he was looking for something. He was either walking somewhere or coming from somewhere. Just like me, where I'm just like, okay, I'm going somewhere. I don't know where, but I'm going to move. Wow. Well, you know what? He's a great, fascinating, animated personality. I, I mean, I was more into Clear Six Points at all than Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but um, I'm so glad that you had that random run in. And I almost wish that when we saw the Sabrina panel that, uh, what's his name again? Alemi Ballard. Alemi Ballard. Wow, I cannot remember that name. That's a, that's a unique name. Um, I almost wish that he pointed out to you in the audience and be like, you, I know you from somewhere. I can't pinpoint you, but I know you, you. I would have melted. I would have had a great time if that was the interaction. I feel like now in looking hindsight, I should have said something. Like I just didn't say anything to him because I was just nervous and could not find out where I was going. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, as for the first panel that we saw, the, the Boy Meets World panel, I mean, you had... Danielle Fischel, who played Topanga, Will Friedle, who played Eric, uh, Ryder Strong, who played Sean there, uh, Mr. Feeney himself, Bill Daniels, along with his wife in both the show and in real life, um, Mr. Turner, uh, I can't I can't forget, I, I, I can't remember the actor's name, but I, he, he played Mr. Turner, um, and yeah, they had a Q&A with uh, someone from People Magazine, because apparently People Magazine turned out to be like the big sponsor for this entire 90s con, because they were celebrating 50 years, so all across the convention center, we were seeing like these big like billboards in the middle of the hallway of like people magazine covers over the years of like George Clooney, Denzel Washington in the 90s. And man, 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 man. Um, as far as the, Q- the Q&A panel for Boy Meets World at the start, I thought it came off very awkward and disorganized. It seemed like, oh, OK, the moderator is asking questions and a lot of the cast members either don't want to answer, don't have anything to say, don't really know if anybody else is going to have anything to say. Um, I could tell that some of them, you know, particularly Ryder, Danielle and Will, they, they seemed like they were jet lagged, which is understandable because, you know, they're coming out from the West Coast and they're, you know, doing live shows for their Pod Meets World podcast along with these conventions. So I would imagine it's very, very grinding. Uh, but eventually, no, I mean, the, the, the steam picked up and I thought that uh, all of the personalities were engaging. William Daniels, Mr. Feeney himself, I mean, he's <laughs> the guy's 97 years old and he just has that classic unfiltered old man clueless thing going on where uh his wife is trying to sort of aid him and 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 repeat questions to him that the moderator has already asked um and yeah he just doesn't give a shit and i just love that kind of old because he'll just say you know things like oh, i don't know you know these kids were fine to work with and oh i don't know you know voicing the car on night rider that was a stupid thing but whatever i did it for the money <laughs> like i just love this whole vibe that is how i want to be when i'm an old man i was just like yeah i went to myers it was bullshit i don't really care <laughs> <laughs> and um you know it was sad because like once it got to the point where the audience members could ask questions i mean everybody was lined up toward a microphone on the stage and i you know lined up um but uh apparently i their, their limit was like five or six people asking questions and i think maybe i was like seventh eighth or ninth in line um so that was a bummer you know i i was hoping to ask uh, the, those guys questions about the the pod meets world podcast and how they do that since we do a family matters we watch podcasts um but who knows you know uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll see him at a convention some other time and uh we're we're, we're we're keeping our fingers crossed we will keep our fingers crossed i would like to meet all of them so and if mr feeney's available to actually be there when i get to go to another con i can't wait to see him did you count the massive amount of shirts that just said mr feeney i did not i did not i certainly did notice the long consistent line the consistently long line for william dan at his selfie autograph booth um, because I think it was maybe you or Courtney that told me this. 
you know, the guy's 97. You don't know like how much long he has left. So I think a lot of people want to be able to say like, hey, you know, I got a picture of Mr. Feeney or I got an autograph from Mr. Feeney before, you know, he eventually passes away. Um, so I didn't notice those Feeney shirts. Um, but I think that makes sense given the fact that a lot of people clearly wanted to see him and 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 have an experience with him. Uh, yeah, I wish I could have seen his line. His, I think he was gone by the time I got down to that part of the convention floor. Was this after the Boy Meets World panel or before? I, this was definitely after because I didn't make it there for the panel at all. So I think when I went down to the convention room, which was what, 1.30ish when I first walked in there, he was gone. He was not there. And there was nobody in his line. And I wanted to actually see him and how many people were going to be in his line. Oh, my God. I could have sworn you were with us at the Boy Meets World panel. But yeah, that's right. You joined us at the Sabrina the Teenage Witch panel. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Got it. It all makes sense. Um, yeah, no surprise. I mean, there was a long line outside the ballroom where the panel was taking place. I mean, same thing for the Sabrina panel, the Dawson's Creek panel. I mean, a lot of people are passionate fans and want to see these uh, these actors up close. So I I totally get that. Um, but the Sabrina panel that you joined us at, like, what did you what did you think of that? I loved it. The moderator. Oh, I forgot her name. She was really good at what she did. Like she reminded me of Aunt Rachel from is it Full House? Um, OK, sort of. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so it's Kimberly J. Brown. And I had I, I remember I told you and Courtney that she was on this uh, Disney Channel original movie. I think it was called Quince. And it was I think she was like an older sister and her family was like having like 10 babies that she had to like help babysit or something like that. And I mm -hmm. really wanted to be able to ask her uh, a question about that, but she only took questions from her Instagram followers. So that was unfortunate. Um, but really, you think she looks like Aunt Rachel from Full House? She just reminded me of her. Not looks oh, no. like her. She just reminded me of her. Oh, no, you mean Aunt Becky. Aunt Becky. I don't know those people's names. I didn't get into that show. But I know there was somebody on there. It was like, oh, that's like their aunt or something. And she reminded me of her. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't see the resemblance. But hey, I mean, if, if that's what you see, that's what you see. Um, as, as far as the panel itself, I thought it was actually a lot more engaging than the Boy Meets World panel, whereas the Boy Meets World panel, it was, um, again, that, you know, uh, lots of moments of awkward silence like who's going to pass the mic to who who's going to answer this question if i don't know if you noticed the sabrina panel like that cast they they had no shortage of words they were just boom 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 conversing with each other animated humorous um and and that's what you want to see you know yeah you could tell that they all really liked each other and built a really good connection because it was just like a group of friends just up there just shooting the shit talking they all had really good stories like really good stories that i didn't even think of this whole time i thought sabrina was a teenager and melissa joe hart was in her 20s the whole time i did not know that uh yeah so that i mean unfortunately that's a common thing i mean with uh, high school shows especially in the 90s, maybe bleeding into the in the 2000s, um, you've had actors cast that were commonly in their 20s, maybe in the case of one cast member from Dawson's Creek in her 30s <laughs> playing a high schooler because she, you know, looks like a kid. But also, I think it has to do with uh, the child labor laws of it, because if you think about it, like, you know, you're underage, you're a minor, you're only allowed to work a certain amount of hours a day. So I think that it just became common to cast young adults in high school shows because it's like, oh, hey, if we need like a 20 hour day, then we're legally able to keep them for 20 hours working straight. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I recently, I don't know if anybody started this. If it'll even still be relevant when this comes out. I started watching Quiet on Set and I, a lot of this, I get why there were adult actors, the child labor law aspect of it, things that kids should not be doing. That's why they casted people who were older in some circumstances. But it's just like, I was blown. My whole mind was blown because I have not researched anything about Sabrina or even Clarissa Explains It All since I watched them as a kid. And that was just like one of those moments I'm like, wait, she was 20 years old this whole time and I swore we were almost the same age. Yeah, yeah. Like when she was doing Clarissa on Nickelodeon, Melissa Joan Hart, I think was around the same age uh, that her actual character was. Um, yeah, no, but as for the Sabrina panel, it was uh, it, it, it was just fun to see the cast interacting as fun the way they did. Um, I would say 
big thing, the probably the biggest thing that stuck out to me was them uh, talking about like, oh man, there's just not much on TV these days that the whole family can gather together to watch. Uh, Cause that was the thing, you know, back in the nineties, maybe eighties and, and before that, uh, I mean, essentially back when, you know, network TV cable were, were Kings, uh, you had a lot of content where it uh, could be something that, you know, the, the parents and the children, whether they be teenagers or, or preteens could watch together, um, you know, namely because, you know, uh, I think a lot of households used to have just like one TV set in the house. Um, but yeah, no, nowadays with the, all the options that we have to consume content through our phones or tablets and whatnot, I mean, it's the, the audiences are very niche and spread out and very specific. And I think that i mean th- th- there there could be pros and cons to that i mean i think the pro is that audiences that were not heard back in those olden days are now being heard um so for example if there's a podcast or a docu series about the history of scotch tape i can guarantee you that back in 1984 or 1990 whatever that wouldn't have been made because it was all about how can we entertain how can we get the most people possible to watch how can we appeal to everybody so i think that the pro nowadays is that like all the, the the people like you and me who have like these very quirky specific interests, we have so many avenues where we could have that interest expressed. Um, but you know, again, the con is uh, that that could lead to less bonding amongst family, amongst friends, and whatnot because we're just so isolated often with our phone, tablet, computer, TV, whatever, uh, with our own specific content. So I don't know if you have thoughts about that. I mean, for me, it's the same way of. I feel like it's divided a lot of people when it comes to the social activity of watching television. Like the only sitcom right now that I can think of that I watch that I would watch with my nephews, my niece, my dad, my brother, where it could appeal to all of us is Abbott Elementary. That's the only show right now that's just in my spectrum. And I was actually thinking the other day, like, what other shows would I put on to watch in a family setting or something? Because everything else I watch, it's pretty geared specifically to that audience. And I do feel like it's kind of destroyed that dynamic of everybody get together on a Friday night with the family and you watch kids. TJF would not work in our time period now. TJF was like, great, because it has something for everybody. And the family sits down and watch. But now if there's TGIF, it wouldn't be that way. I don't think it would be a social gathering for the family because nobody's just watching network TV. Or if you're smart, you're pirating your television. <laughs> like you, Andrew, illegally. <laughs> uh, and we saw many vendors out in the convention floor. Uh, I think I had mentioned to you that uh, the like the magic wand vendor was was pretty interesting. They had like these custom hardwood made magic wands. I, I feel like it would be something that like Nick Offerman or Daniel Day Lewis would make because those guys are like carpenters and shit. Uh, d- d- were you tempted to get any of those magic wands? I was tempted. I was tempted. I mean. If you know me outside of this, I love me a wand and I have my favorite wands from Ollivanders from Harry Potter. So and I've got the collectors ones. I have the Death Eater wand finally. So I love good wands and they looked incredibly beautiful. But the only reason why I didn't get any of them is they had this varnish on it that made my fingers a little itchy. And I don't know if I was allergic to it when I picked up one of them, but they were beautiful. They were beautifully crafted. I know they're amazing, but when my hands started itching, I was like, let me not get this. If it's something I'm allergic to, that would suck to have at home. Yeah, because like all of these things that that are being sold at the convention, I mean, they're they're not cheap. Um, I would imagine. I mean, how how much were those wands going for? I think they were thirty dollars a piece. Okay, yeah. If you're buying something, if you're buying a wand for thirty dollars, you want to make sure that it fits with your life style so any hint of like oh my god this could like you know make me itchy or make me allergenic like yeah i I think you were right to bypass that and just appreciate the experience as it was at the convention yeah it was beautiful and if those people are out there i hope you sell tons of wands because they are 
beautiful. They were all different in their own way. It's just, I could not risk buying one of those. Yeah. And so many other sites that we saw on the convention floor, uh, there was like a goosebumps table. Um, oh, I remember we, 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 uh, passed by a lot of, um, a lot of posters, a lot of sort of memorabilia of things like, you know, Dallas or various superheroes. Uh, that was nice. Oh, we ran into the, um, uh, what's her name? Ruth from Chaz and AJ in the morning on, I believe WPLR in New Haven, Connecticut. She just wanted to like interview us like spontaneously about our podcast and about our uh, experience at the convention. Like, how, how, how did you feel about that? That was fun. As soon as she walked up and looked at us, I was like, okay, she's from something and I don't know what she's from, but she looks like she wants to talk to us. And then she's just like, can I interview you too? Yeah. And she was uh, asking us wonderful questions about the podcast, about uh, our love of family matters. She was putting us on the spot and asking us to do our uh, best Steve Urkel impersonations. And I got to applaud you because, you know, I'm usually the guy on this podcast that does the, the the goofy stupid impersonations and you gave a great steve urkel andrew <laughs> <laughs> thank you i tried to keep up keep up i think i said look what you did yeah something like that uh look what you did or did i do that like something like that i don't know it's steve, steve urkel has a, a million catchphrases but yeah, no, I mean, we took pictures with Ruth and to this day, I'm still waiting to see if our interview is broadcast. I, I haven't heard back from Ruth or Chaz and AJ, but nonetheless, um, you know, thank you for be the experience and, and talking to us and giving us some free publicity for the podcast. Yes, we appreciate it. When we become rich and famous, you'll have the first audio clip of us doing an interview. Yeah, I did want to uh, take advantage of that Nickelodeon slime machine. There was a little slime machine area where you could get slimes, thankfully, with like a raincoat on. Um, but one... Um, I don't like waiting in a line as you and I both attested to at the convention and to, I don't know, maybe there was a part of me that was like, eh, yes, it was a childhood dream of mine to be slimed, but maybe like, it'll be one of those things where like I do it and I'm like, oh, that wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. So maybe like, cause it's, it's like the same thing of like being afraid to meet your favorite celebrity, right? Like I, I, maybe Beyonce, you have this thing of like, oh, I want to meet Beyonce, but if I do, maybe like the high expectations that I have will be decreased at some point. I think that's the way that I felt about being slimed. It was like, mm, maybe it's better to just have that thought in my head stay there of like, oh, that, that would have been an awesome thing to do. I want to meet Beyonce. I don't care how you are. I don't care how you act. I don't care how I feel. I'm going to be crying the entire time. I want to meet you. <laughs> That's okay. that in the universe. I'm going to put it out there. If it ever happens, I will be so honored and I will cry. And I promise that I will not get tears on whatever beautiful thing you're wearing. Um, the actual act of getting slimed, I think about it the way you think about it. So as a child getting slimed, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. As an adult, I'm being like, okay, now I'm going to have slime on me. My clothes are probably going to be damp. I'm not going to be comfortable. What if it's sticky? What if it tastes bad? What if it smells bad? All these yeah. things that I would not have cared about as a kid, I cared about. Yeah, yeah. And, and to what it tastes like, I mean, I don't know. I, I think I read somewhere what the ingredients were. And I was, I don't know, do, do you know what the ingredients of slime are? Do you know if it's edible or not edible? So uh, from what I know about in the past, it was edible. Like I got the little Nickelodeon make your own slime kit at home once. And I feel like it was like cornstarch and food coloring and just some water and stuff. And that's what made the slime in its consistency. So it wasn't toxic, but I just don't imagine it'll taste good. You had the make your own slime kit. I'm so jealous. How was that? Did you enjoy it? Um, From what I remember, me and my brother, brother made the slime and then he threw it out the window to get me mad because he just wanted to do that as a mean brother or did he have a specific reason i think that i threw something away of his and we were just being mean brothers Mm. <laughs> I know that dynamic all too well. Uh, we took a picture on the orange Nick couch. I, I think they they uh, had that orange couch most often on their SNCC Saturday night programming block. Uh, we took a picture in front of those like TVs that were all stacked up on each other. And they mm -hmm. had like a very retro 90s look to it when the TVs were on. That was pretty awesome. That was pretty awesome. That looked like it was from the set of the early state days of TRL. And I wanted to ask somebody that, but nobody knew. And might have been it might have been i mean i 
think MTV and Nickelodeon still are owned by Viacom. If not, then whatever. But um, yeah, that, that, that might be it. Uh, I love taking a picture with the golden gays. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I assume they were gay men dressed up as the golden girls. And they saw my Family Matters podcast shirt and they made the connection of like, oh, yeah, I remember when uh, B. Arthur did the Urkel dance with Jaleel uh, at the, I think it was maybe the Emmy Awards or something like that back in the early 90s. And so I got to take a picture with them. That was great. Um, any other b- big convention floor highlights you can think of, Andrew? Um, one of my major ones, I brought a quartz. It was a purple, ugh, tongue-tied, purple quartz Gengar statue from Pokemon. So if you like Pokemon, Gengar is a ghost Pokemon and he plays tricks on people just to play tricks on them. And I found a stone statue that somebody carved on their own from purple quartz of it. And it is my prized possession from this convention. So, wow, you, I, maybe, maybe I just was looking in the wrong way, but I did not see anything Pokemon related at 90s con. And of course, Pokemon was a big thing in the 90s. Um, So 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 did you see a lot of Pokemon stuff that I was just missing? I saw tons. Oh, I bought a Pikachu keychain too. The cutest little Pikachu keychain, but I got the Pikachu keychain. I got the Rose Quartz uh, Gengar. There was the Pokemon trading card table, which, oh my God, if you are an enthusiast of Pokemon, they... Well, the seller had a first edition holographic Charizard at his table on sale for $2,000 and somebody was going to buy it. I don't know if this person completed the purchase, but that's a steal one for that price for that card. That is a steal. If I had the money, I would have paid for it. But oh my gosh, this guy, he had pretty much any one of the rare cards you could think of at that table. This one lady, I wanted to tie your Harding her. He had a holographic first edition Gengar card and she bought it before I could. Wow. Um, so my question is, once you get that rare card collection, if you did in fact have the $2,000 to pay for it, do you just keep it in like this very uh, pristine shelf case never to be touched ever again? Do you try to play a, a Pokemon trading card game with yourself? Do you play with friends with it? Like, how do you go about actively using uh, that that collection once you get it? Now, for me, that card will never be touched by human hands ever again. It is going to stay in a very secure binder that I keep in a very safe place with all my other very rare Pokemon cards. And it probably would not see the light of day until I'm in my 60s just to take it out and get it appraised and sell it at that point. Wow. Well, <laughs> shout out to you and all the other passionate Pokemon fans out there. I remember, I think I told this story to you, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, uh, the private Christian elementary school I went to, like at recess, just seeing a bunch of friends uh, playing with their Pokemon trading cards and just being like, oh, I want to feel included, but I can't because, of course, I got parents who are religious and think that Pokemon is the devil and witchcraft. And I think I might have told you also the story of like <laughs> a, a, a person in the neighborhood that lived not too far from me in New Britain, Connecticut. I had lied to him and told him that I had Pokemon trading cards and invited him to come over to my house and see them, even though I knew I did not have them. And it just ended up with an awkward moment where like, you know, I was going through the closet. He was right behind me and I was like, uh, uh, oh, they're like way up there. I, I can't reach. Sorry. Can you still be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> John, I can relate. I was told that Pokemon was the witchcraft and the devil, so I can get it. So how did that play out once you were like, yeah, I can't reach out the Pokemon cards. Did you guys kind of just gloss it over and move on? I think so. I don't remember that friend hating me or saying bad things about me. It just was just that thing of like, oh, okay, I guess you don't get it. So let's just go back to riding bikes together outside or something. Uh, Well, see, that's the great thing about kids because they're like, well, fuck it. Let's just go do something else. Yeah. Like all we want is uh, company, free kid fun. That's all we care about. So, oh yeah, we got lots of compliments on our shirts uh, for, for those of you listening. If you haven't seen, I mean, go, please go check out our Instagram, Facebook at Family Matters Rewatch Pod. We posted uh, our podcast shirts. Uh, on the front, we have the main podcast photo that you tend to see on our podcast feed. And on the back, Andrew and I had individual, unique you know, sort of catchphrases and characters kind of related to like things that we've said on the podcast. What did you have on your shirt, Andrew? Mine was a picture of Judy Winslow, uh, the one and only Judith Winslow. And above her, a warning that says, don't go upstairs. Yeah, a lot of great feedback. Um, I mean, we were waiting in line for lunch and had some people that were like, oh my God. 
and and for some reason your QR code wasn't working for a little bit, so we had to struggle with that. Oh my God, the struggle of technology. It didn't work, but I'm happy that people got to see it and people took pictures of it. So now people out there, you now have that warning in your phone. Yes. So it was a balance. We had both uh, fun compliments like, oh, haha, I love your Judy Winslow shirt, Andrew. And then we had uh, one gentleman that was not as uh, family friendly with his response. Can you explain what he said? Uh, it was so awkward. It was so, okay, just to set the tone, because this was the cringiest moment for me all weekend. So we're walking out of the convention center floor where they're doing autographs for people. There's a good group of people behind us in this one line to see somebody at their table. And there's just people walking around. There's a security guard. He's standing against the wall near the door at night by the exit. So I walk by him and he's like, oh, hey, yo, let me see your shirt. And so then I go back and, you know, I show him the back of my shirt and he sees the picture of Judy Winslow and don't go upstairs. And he laughs and he makes a joke about her going upstairs, never coming back down. That is fine. And then I came back with like, yeah, we never saw her again we really never got to see her and it sucks and then at the top of his lungs he's like no we saw her again in that porn and i was like oh my god this is so weird like there are children around us and you're talking about the porno like i'm like okay and i just kind of just tapped out with just like a genuine smile just like oh ha ha that's great and i'm just trying to end the conversation and walk away at that point yeah. And, you know, for you listening, if you don't know, um, Jamie Foxworth, I think in the 2000s had a period where she was an adult film performer. Um, and look, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a straight guy, like, you know, um, amongst the many porn videos I've seen in, in my lifetime, I, I think I've briefly seen Jamie stuff in passing. But even if I did, I know how to compartmentalize the sort of safe, family-friendly, joyous comfort food of Family Matters with porn. You know what I mean? And especially, um, I think this uh, period in Jamie's life was a dark period for her. Um, I just feel like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, like it happened, but let's not let that uh, define the legacy of Judy and Jamie. Like she's just so much bigger than that. She's just so more, so much more varied and so much more versatile than that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you, Andrew. I mean, when a guy like him says that, it's just kind of like, how, I mean, how do we react to that? We're at a '90s con. We're 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 talking about things that you know we grew up with in our childhood. Where it, it's a safe, comfortable, uh, sentimental space, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, look at that porn, and it's like, what? Okay, different energy, different energy. Uh, um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that we were both on the same page. I mean, you have a gr great poker face and you know how to just like keep the conversation rolling and let people know that, you know, they're, they're wonderful in your company. Um, but yeah, internally I was just like, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's keep it open because I don't want to have this conversation. And neither did I, I just, it was so random and weird. Like it was just weird. And I was weirded out by it. And I think the part that upset me the most is the dude was hot. He was a sexy man. And I would have been like, oh my God, scan my shirt and take a little picture with me and just follow me on Facebook. Because I would have been like, oh shit, this cute dude did all this. But no, like, it's just, it, it was like talking to a brick wall. Like, he did not get it that I am not here to talk about porn at all. Like, at all. And he did not get it. And I'm just very happy that we were able to get out of that situation because it just was a cringy moment. And anybody who would want to come up to and talk to me about that, I'm okay with having a conversation, but there's a time and space. And there's also just etiquette to these kinds of conversations that you should be having that he did not have at all. He was expecting me to walk over and fist bump him and be like, yeah, that porn though. No, that was not happening. And so it's weird. It's weird because it's like, you know, you know th that this is the child you're looking at on the shirt, right? So to automatically go from like, oh, hey, here's that child actor from one of our favorite childhood shows to, hey, uh, but she was hot in that porn. It was just like, <laughs> no, no. Like, I think if we were totally talking about 
an adult woman from beginning to end. Okay, that could be another story. But when your jumping off point is seeing a child actor on your shirt, it's just like, <laughs> no, badly misplaced, my friend. Badly misplaced. Um, so that guy probably would have been the same guy, like, because because my shirt, uh, on the back of my shirt was a, you know, you know sassy looking Mama Winslow being like, way to go, Carl. Uh, that same guy probably would have been like, oh, but, you know, how about that moment when Mama Winslow, you know, talked about the lingerie that she was holding up in the kitchen, right? <laughs> like, no, that's not family matters. It's not. It is not. Why would you say that? So aside from that, man, we had a lot of uh, pleasant, lovely people who loved our shirts. Uh, some scanned our QR codes. Um, I think some we took pictures with. Um, I, I really, really, really appreciated that. Um, some people actually commented the fact that the Family Matters cast came to 90s Con two years ago. I think Ag Judy Winslow Matters on Instagram said that two years ago, it was the very first 90s Con. And also that was the place where Joe Marie Payton confirmed that she would not do a reboot if Jamie wasn't involved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is very true. And a lot of people had nothing but good things to say about Joe Marie Bayon, like that she was loving, approachable, and every single person who had interaction with her was amazing. Yeah, like she literally is that comforting Black mother that we saw in Harriet Winslow over the course of nine years. I mean, I went to get a brownie at the convention and the brownie guy was like, oh, hey, yeah, Joe Marie Payton got my brownie. She loved my brownies, man. It's like, <laughs> why, can't, why couldn't we have this cast back again? Especially, especially especially because having the Family Matters cast could have brought some diversity to the convention. My sister, Natalie, when I went to see my family the following day, they also live in Connecticut. Uh, when I was telling her about my 90s con experience, she brought this to mind, Andrew. She, she was like, oh, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine was kind of complaining about the fact that they don't have like black shows. Like you don't see like living single. You don't see Fresh Prince. I didn't think about that until literally that conversation with Natalie. Like, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Boy Meets World, Dawson's Creek, Full House, all the main Q&A panels. It, yeah, it was a lot of white in that 90s con. And I get that there's so much to the 90s that you can't cover everything in one convention. But because we're living in a very um, politically correct age, now that I think about it, it's like, oh, you know, it, 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 even if you couldn't get the cast members to come appear, uh, just in some way or another, like have have some balance. Like, oh, for every Sabrina and Boy Meets World, have a Fresh Prince or Living Single or Martin or uh, Blaine's Brothers. I mean, so what, what, what are your thoughts about all that? I thought about that when I was walking through the parking garage to go to my car after we left the convention. Like, I was just walking. I was just thinking, I was like, I don't remember one Black show that was represented at this con on any of the days. But then also as I was walking out, I was like, damn, there weren't much Black people in there at all. Like, talent-wise, attendee-wise, I was like, this is a pretty non-diverse white audience that is here. I mean, there were some Black people, but I could say I could probably count us all on one hand because I think every Black person at the convention, I gave a head nod to at least. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, we're not represented, but, you know, whatever. We're, 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 we're going to, we got to start somewhere by being at the con and making ourselves known to people that like, hey, like, have some Black shows. Um, off the top of my head, I think the only diversity was, uh, of course, the quiz master from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. She was on the panel. Um, the visitors who played maybe the only two Black characters in Clueless from the cosplay contest at the con convention. Um, I, the, the, the guy who made the inappropriate Jimmy Fox with porn comment was black. Um, I remember we had some, we, we, we had a few uh, black women uh, compliment our shirt. Yeah. The, it, so it was like very sparse, the, 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 the people of color representation at the con. Yeah. I, this is not even me trying to make a joke. I want to say out of maybe 400 people who were there that we were around 20 to 30 of them were black. Like it was a very small, 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 small group of black people that I saw and inside the convention floor. I only saw one black vendor. I didn't see any other vendors that were black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I mean, you know, in terms of cast members from these 90s black shows, they, I know either they might not want to do these kind of conventions because it could be to them. It could be like, oh, my God, that, that was the thing I did 30 years ago. And it's just going to look pathetic if I'm trying to revive something from 30 years ago. Uh, it could just be that, you know, a lot of uh, these uh, black actors from the 90s just don't have the schedule availability. Um, but, you know, leaving that aside, I mean, even if you can't get like a Fresh Prince Q&A panel or a Living Single Q&A panel, 
um, I don't know, just like have posters, have maybe more obvious memorabilia, uh, just something that shows that like, hey, the 90s wasn't just a wedding dress. It wasn't just this pure white thing. It was all shades of color. It was. And uh, a lot of the Black 90s shows that were on helped shape the actual pattern and flow of TV all over the spectrum at that time. I mean, we're still doing now, I can't lie. But it's one of those things where it's like, hey, there's more Black influence here than you guys realize, and it should be represented. And it wasn't. It wasn't, yep. unfortunately. Like like you're saying, even just the photos. I mean, People Magazine, this is their 50th year celebration of doing something like this. You would think at least People Magazine that has had Black people in it would have some kind of posters with representation. So um, they did, but... It was the, it, so the Denzel cover that I mentioned that I saw, I think it was like, I don't know, because Denzel was the sexiest man alive at one point, I think in the 90s. Um, that was the only representation that I saw. Other than that, it was like George Clooney, the cast of Friends. So I saw the Denzel poster and I remember you pointing it out. And that itself to me was problematic. So we're only showing Denzel here as him being the sexiest objectified man. We don't have anything else that we're representing him for. And that was a problem for me. It's one of those things where you kind of feel like you're being objectified as a black person that the only representation we have here is Denzel Washington, but not for his acting just because he's the sexiest man alive. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of that cosplay contest, how about it? I mean, I thought it was a fun, good time. Um, I have my opinion on who should have been first, second, third place. Uh, can, can you tell me about the uh, the costumes that you loved the most and maybe what you thought should have been first and second and third place? Like the costume contest for me was good. It was very good. I enjoyed the cosplay. Um, as far as the winners, I feel like uh, there was somebody dressed as Predator. I feel like should have been number one. That costume was phenomenal. If you're familiar with Predator, he had the computer on his wrist. It worked perfectly. He had his net. He had the removable mask, which the only thing I'm going to read you on is that mask was not from the 90s Predator. That was from the 2000s Alien versus Predator when the alien scratches the Predator's mask. And that's why those slash marks were on the mask. So the mask was not the same era of era of Predator that it should have been for the 90s con. Then Miss Frizzle was there. Miss Frizzle was play. It was represented by a person of color. Um, and I feel like she should have gotten second place. If she had the Anguada, I would have been like first place for her right away. Mm -hmm. And then third place, this little girl, uh, I forgot who the little girl was supposed to be, but she should have at least gotten third place or first place because this little girl came up there. Who was she supposed to be? I think you're uh, Michelle from Full House. Yes, she was Michelle from Full House. That little girl should have won. I think she should have won and uh, she got cheated. She got cheated and she was the winner. Look, I as, even as someone who wants to be a parent someday, like I know uh, a I know a cute kid sympathy when I see one. I personally would have not voted for her because I thought like, ah, whatever. She's a cute little kid. Of course, people are going to be suckers for that, especially when she was clearly trained by her mom to say some phrase that Michelle, I guess, said on, on Full House. My vote for first, second and third place, first place, just like you, the Predator costume. I think that, um, God, the effort that it took to either build that costume from scratch or buy it from somewhere, especially, I mean, the guy, the guy in the costume, he made uh, no hesitation to mention how freaking hot he was in that suit. So I think mm -hmm. the effort that he took all around to dress up for this contest, he should have won first place off the bat. Second place, I would have voted for the 90 snacks. Um, I think it was a group of female friends and and they had done the cosplay contest before. And this year they decided to like, you know, up their game and one dressed up as a zebra cake, which I thought, I mean, you know, I, I, so I was born in 91. So really my memory of the 90s doesn't go past like the mid 90s. So my first zebra cake I remember was like 2000, whatever. So I, in my mind, it's like, oh, zebra cakes were in the 2000s, but apparently zebra cakes were in the 90s. Um, and then I think someone else was a drink called Splurge. Surge, Surge Cola. I've never heard of that. that. That was a drink that you drank? I don't drink soda. I never have, but my brother loved it. And it is a 90s cola. And I think it was just one more girl and she was Fruit by the Foot. There's Fruit by, 
fruit by the foot and then another girl who was the Danimals Dunkaroos. Ah, uh, yes. I don't know if Dunkaroo is from Danimals, but yes, she was a Dunkaroo. Um, and out of all those, I think the zebra cake and the Dunkaroo and the fruit by the foot, actually most of them, uh, most of these 90 snacks are still in existence. Um, I thought they should have won second place. I mean, namely the zebra cake. I Once I saw the zebra cake, I was like, where the heck do you get that costume? How can I find it? How can I dress up like that for Halloween? I want that. Um, I, I, I showed that uh, to my wife uh, via text. I showed her a picture of that and I knew that she would love that because, you know, Tony buys zebra cake whenever she gets the chance. Um, actually, in fact, the, at work here, uh, someone just randomly offered me free zebra cakes and I was like, oh, okay. I, I have a woman at home who would love these <laughs> just as much as me. <laughs> zebra cakes, I have never had one, but I imagine they are delicious from just the way they look. So zebra cakes are a national language. Yeah. Now, if you don't have uh, the classic, like severe black people lactose intolerant gene that seems to go around in our race, then I think you'll love it. Um, I mean, me, for the most part, I'm OK, but I know that, you know, if it's like a bad day where maybe I drank something bad, like you give me one zebra cake, I'm never going to leave the bathroom. <laughs> I am 100 percent understanding of that. I had just mashed potatoes at a restaurant last night. There were not supposed to be milk in it and there was milk in it. And all day long, I have felt like I am like going to die. I feel terrible. Oh my God, I feel so bad. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, here at work, we had uh, some donuts delivered from this place called Twisted Halo. And they're mm. different in that because like there are these chunky, I think jelly drizzle donuts. Like they are, they are just, it's it's just dripping wet, soaked with, I think jelly. And I ate the, it, and I ate just one and I was like, oh my God, this is great. I love this. Maybe two seconds later. Oh, okay. What, what's that in my underwear? Okay, let me go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, PSA, watch what you eat, watch what you eat. But anyway, back to the cosplay contest. I think third place, I wanted, oh, the the guy who had the Oscar the Grouch, like he had the Oscar the Grouch in the trash can attached to his, like his chest and his belly. Um, I, I would have voted for that as third place. Okay, I can see that he was pretty good. He allowed, what was your favorite part of his costume? Oh, the Oscar the Grouch part. <laughs> Oscar, okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think had he uh, just had the trash can, it would have been like math. But um, I was suspicious of the fact. I was like, wait a minute, is that is, is an Oscar supposed to pop out that trash can? And then it did. And then I think he actually like mimicked the voice of Oscar. I, I thought that was fabulous. It was. It was really good. I was with you because at first I thought he wasn't going to open the garbage can. So I was like, is that a bomb? Like, what is going to happen here? And then <laughs> after he opens it, I'm like, oh, it's Oscar. I think some other highlights uh, from the cosplay contest. Oh, the guy the guy that was a hybrid of Super Mario and Steve from Blue's Clues. And then he, like, I think broke out into a dance and did the, you know, the mail time Steve song for Blue's Clues. Like, that, that, that was a show. It, he was quite in energetic and entertaining. Uh, he definitely should have gotten an honorable mention. Yeah, but uh, the American Girl doll uh, person ended up getting an honorable mention. And I was like, eh, you know, it's an old timey Martha Washington dress. OK, whatever. Yeah, I, was like, I wanted to like the American Girl doll's outfit, which it was beautiful. And she made it all by hand. But I was just like, I don't really even remember American Girl dolls from the 90s because it wasn't really in like my spectrum of things back then. So I was like, oh, OK, this is cool. But because we needed that full explanation for the costume, I was like, yeah, you, you should not win. Yeah, I don't know. And then we had um, Stacey Dash's character from Clueless and her boyfriend. Um, again, I think maybe only the two the only two people of color in Clueless. You watched that movie. I didn't really watch it. The, were they only the only black people in that movie? They are the only black people in all of Hollywood in that movie. I don't think there's another black person in that movie. Um, let's see what else. Oh, so I got a I got a little tidbit of the, the of the Dawson's Creek Q and A Q&A panel with uh, James Vanderbeek who played Dawson and um, Kerr Smith, I believe his name is, who played. Um, uh, character. I kind of forgot his name, but he was initially brought on as like a competing love interest for Dawson's love interest, Joey. And then, oh, Jack. Jack is the name of the guy. Uh, he played Jack. And then Jack eventually came out and his identity was like, oh, here's the gay kid trying to make it through late 90s, early 2000s, New England. And uh, Michelle Williams, who played Jen on the show, 
um, they they basically had the stereotype of like, oh, hey, here's the 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 the, the gay guy and the straight girl becoming besties forever. So, um, I mean, because you know that show got me through wisdom teeth healing, I, uh, I I had a soft spot for Dawson's Creek, so I enjoyed uh, James and Kerr. Uh, you know, uh, reminiscing at the panel, having very intelligent, funny, well thought out responses. I loved that. Um, I didn't bother to say for the whole house panel. Uh, I think by then that would have been the fourth panel I would have gone to because just like you, I mean, I never had a connection to full house. Um, I had family members, maybe like cousins, siblings younger than me who watched, you know, some of the Nick at night reruns back in the day. Um, I know my wife's friend who, he, who she used to have a house with uh, is very into full house, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I bought on to it too late and just saw it as a very cheesy show. Yeah. I'm with you there. I couldn't get into it. The only thing I know about Full House is that John Stamos is a hottie. That is the only thing I know. I don't know anything else about that show. So by the time that panel was happening, I was like, okay, I'm okay with going just back to the hotel and going to sleep for a little. And he is an honorary black man, John Stamos, and that look at him now. I mean, the guys must be like, what, 60 or something? And he still looks pretty young and hot. Mm -hmm. He's still fine. Still fine. John Stamos, just uh, call me. That's all I need you to do. Just call me. Yeah. So if he was at the panel, you probably would have been there. If he was at the panel, I would have walked in for first like five minutes just to get a good picture of him. And then I would have left. Yeah. But I think it was like Dave Coulier who played... Not Danny, not John Stamos' character, but the other guy, Joey, the the, the comical the one of the of the three men uh, that were in mm-hmm. that house. Um, Jody Sweeten, who played the middle child, uh, Stephanie Tanner was there, and then I think that was it. Um, so yeah, uh, ignored that full house panel, and I don't know. I mean, anything else from the nineties con? I mean, I think that were th- those were my big highlights. My last big highlight, and to everybody who's a gamer out there, I got to play Duck Hunt. I got to play Duck Hunt, and it's been 30-something years since I have played that game. It was so much fun with the original gun controller and everything. So that was a blast to play. Oh my god, and then I also played X-Men versus Capcom. If you know that game, you know it is phenomenal, and it was the real arcade game. So those are my two highlights. So wait, was that when I was uh, upstairs watching the Dawson's Creek panel? Yeah, when you went up there, I went over to the little arcade area. So so they had a bunch of stuff there. The only thing that I could not get to play that I really wanted to play, if you know the 90s, you know Dreamcast, late 90s, early 2000s, that Dreamcast system is so much fun to play. It got discontinued, but they had Power Stone and Marvel vs. Capcom 2 over there. The line at that system was so long. It was longer than some the lines to get autographs because you can't find those games anywhere. And I wish I could have played that. Yeah, I thought it very awesome because you and I had the same reaction. When we went to like the video game area, we saw like a bunch of TV screens and the old school Nintendo 64s. And we were just like, wait, what? Oh my God, that's pretty awesome. Like, so everybody can like actually, you know, have the experience of, you know, having the cartridge and blowing off on it before they put it in the system. And um, Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm glad that you got to uh, experience that uh, old school video game-ness. Yeah, it was a fun time. It was, it was great. I, oh, there was one other thing that I saw, and unfortunately, I did not get to talk to this woman, but she was doing tattoos of little 90s cartoon characters on people, and I wanted to get one, and I didn't get a chance to talk to her, but her work looked beautiful. She is on the vendor website. I don't know her name by heart right now, but if you see her, she was super nice. Give her some business. She was a fun person to talk to for like the two seconds that I got to say hello, but she was doing some really nice tattoos for people, and her line was really long as well. Wow. Um, I, I mean, I would say a big thing, maybe a big closing thought on the 90s con is just if you are like me and Andrew for you listening and time is very valuable to you, do not feel like the worst person in the world if you don't want to wait in these long ass lines to meet these uh, celebrities to get to get what what turns out to be like, I don't know, a $30 autograph, a $50 selfie or whatever. Um, and, and look, I mean, this is not to shame the people that are willing to wait forever to see the Boy Meets World cast members, to see Alyssa Milano, to see Susan Sarandon. To this day, I will never know 
why Susan Sarandon was at the 90s con because it's like, because I think I was talking about this with Courtney, like Susan Sarandon, she's had a, a career in Hollywood, a very distinguished film career that has lasted like well beyond the 90s. I think she's been around for like 40, 50, maybe 60 years or whatever. And mm -hmm. one, I don't think, I mean, even though she did do movies in the 90s, I don't think one associates Susan Sarandon and the 90s like they would say Melissa Joan Hart in the 90s or the Boy Meets World cast in the 90s. Like it was just a very interesting thing to see her there. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. When I saw her booth set up, I'm like, why is Susan Sarandon here? Of all people, I'm not mad that she was because she's an amazing actress, but I just was not expecting her to be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anytime I passed by, she wasn't even out of her booth. There was just people waiting in line for it. So maybe I just missed her and she was at lunch every time that I passed by. Um, yeah, constantly a lot of people to see Alyssa Milano. I, I actually saw her recently in that movie Fear with Mark Wahlberg and Reese Witherspoon on Netflix. So that was an interesting watch. Um, and I think Alyssa Milano, wasn't she in that Who's the Boss sitcom with Tony Danza? And I don't know if you remember that show. Mm -hmm. She's in that show. And then she's also the host of Project Runway. Oh, wow. And I think she may have really kicked off the Me Too movement. Yeah, I think I, I feel like she did. not she like kick off the hashtag online and everything? I feel like she was the first person. I think she did something with the hashtag. And then she was on a few interviews talking about the importance of Me Too that I remember. Yeah. So I know she's heavily involved. Yeah. Long lines for writer Danielle and uh, Will from Boy Meets World. Uh, it was kind of awkward to see, but William uh, Russ and Betsy Randall, who played uh, Corey Matthews' parents, like not a lot of people were in line for them. Uh, so I kind of felt bad seeing them at their empty station while, you know, uh, Topanga, Eric, and Sean got a lot of love. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to shame people who wait in line all day. Like, hey, if that's your thing and you really want to have an experience with these people, have it. Um, but for me, even though like we're there to network as a Family Matters Rewatch podcast, I, I just can't help but think like, eh, yeah, that's a lot of time that I'm spending just standing in one place where I could just do something else where I could, you know, go to a panel and have some lunch, walk around, meet people um, all to get this very two second experience because, you know, it was like 445 or whatever. And the lines were still long for these celebrities and the convention ends at six. So I'm thinking like, oh, man, maybe some of these people are going to get like kicked out because they, they're just it's not enough time for all these people um yeah, I, you know, that's just my PSA is to, if you see a long ass line for your favorite celebrity to get an autograph or whatever, uh, I mean, possibly for you, with the exception of Beyonce, Andrew, I would say, uh, you know, feel free to just go, go about your day and 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 value your time. <laughs> yeah, to go about your day, value your time. I would not even, I wouldn't get into a line at a meet and greet for Beyonce unless it was like specifically just us in the room nobody else can get in line it's like a very small limited group of people because i'm not waiting in line past 20 minutes like i'm out of there i don't have that just patience in me and i'll see you in the next album or something girl we can talk then but as far as like waiting in line i don't think i would do it and even at any convention i've been at i've only ever gotten one signature and that was because i was working at one of them but i just don't have it in me to just wait in line and I'm always, I'm one of those people, I believe in the statement, don't meet your heroes because they will let you down. And that's why I have never tried to meet anybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's a valid thing. Uh, and that goes back to my whole slime machine reasoning. Um, I just think that there's a lot better things that we could be doing with our time. I will say, though, uh, to sort of wrap up our 90s kind of conversation, definitely want to go to another one. Um, I think we would benefit a lot more if we either got like a VIP pass or maybe a booth for our podcast, because going back to the meet and greet thing that you mentioned, um, I think a big benefit of having a VIP thing is that like, oh, OK, you don't have to do that long general admission line of waiting forever for, for an autograph or whatever. Like you're pretty much guaranteed to be amongst a limited group of people to get a meet and greet photo op opportunity with whoever you want to get. So even though, yes, it might be pricey, I think it's, you know, over two hundred dollars to get a VIP experience at the 90s. Con, um, I think if we go again, it would be so worth it, especially if, you know, Family Matters cast members happen to be appearing there again. I think it would be yeah. really worth uh, it 
to, to invest in that. I think it would be too. If I find out that the Family Matters cast will be at a 90s con at the next one we go to, I am going to pay for the VIP just to talk with them specifically. Yeah. So yeah, that was 90s con for us, our debut experience. I hope we have a lot more. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a great dinner at uh, the Wooden Tap restaurant in Newington. I have some leftover pasta that is still in my fridge at my home in Vermont. Uh, maybe I'll eat it. Maybe I'll throw it out. I don't know. I mean, I know my wife, Tony, is very much a stickler for like, no, no, throw things out after like three or four days. But, you know, me, I could stare at something after about two weeks and be like, eh, maybe I can still eat it. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, if it goes down, you might as well eat it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to leave my system anyway. Right. That's that's the way I see it. Um, <laughs> any, any highlights from the dinner? Anything? Uh, because, because you had, even though you are a vegan, mister, I think, what did you have? Like some shrimp chicken wings or something? What, what did you have? I had chicken wings and then I got something else. What did I get? French fries. I had French fries and chicken wings. Um, And they were with a uh, teriyaki uh, Thai seasoning. It was like this chili oil that had this very smoky flavor to it. Um, yes, I'm vegan, but fried chicken is my favorite thing in the world. So whenever I'm out of town or if I'm on vacation, if there's fried chicken, I'm going to eat it because I want to know about your town's fried chicken. Like, I would need to know, is it good? Is it bad? This chicken for me was probably like a four out of 10. It was good, but it was not chicken that I would order again. Um, and I say that as somebody who, when I eat chicken, it's very rare that I eat chicken. So I expect it to satisfy all of these things for me. The chicken by itself was not seasoned and that was a problem for me. <laughs> it just, it was not seasoned. So without the sauce, it was just this bland chicken, which I mean, it was cooked thoroughly. It was still moist and everything, but without the sauce, the chicken had no flavor. So I only ate four of the eight wings that they brought me. No, I'm sorry. I only ate three of the eight wings that they brought me at the restaurant. And then later at my hotel, I tried to warm the chicken back up and eat it, but I didn't have the dipping sauce. And I took one bite and I was like, what is this bland, disgusting mess? And I ended up not eating it. I just threw it out, which again was probably good because even those four pieces that I fully ate, oh, my stomach was mad at me in the morning when I woke up. It was like, no, this wasn't worth it, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Wow. I guess maybe I was, I, I could have sworn that you were like saying nothing but complimentary things about the chicken when you were eating it. Um, so to hear you say that experience, I was like, oh, okay. I mean, am I wrong? You, you didn't say anything complimentary about the chicken at, at dinner night? I did. And I had the dipping sauce. I had the dipping sauce to eat with the chicken. Chicken, and it was good. Without that sauce, that chicken was just bland. There was nothing on it. There was no flavoring. It was just a bland piece of fried chicken. And I was like, oh, I was let down at that point. But those french fries, those were probably the best french fries I've had in years. They were good. I mean, that's very telling if dipping sauce makes a difference on chicken so much that if you don't have the dipping sauce, the chicken is just chicken shit. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, you can tell when there's somebody who knows how to cook fried chicken, making fried chicken. Because that chicken will taste good without a single thing on it. This chicken did not taste good without the sauce. It just didn't. It was so bland without it. It was like tofu. And I love me some tofu. But if you don't put seasoning on tofu, tofu is bland. And that's what this chicken was. It was just a bland piece of chicken. Wow. Well, I'm so sorry for that experience. I mean, my pasta, it was like a penne a la vodka thing. Uh, it, it was pretty tasty. Um, but uh, yeah, so we move on from the dinner. We go to a drag show at this club called Chez Est. And uh, that was in the Hartford area. And I thank you for finding uh, the club because, uh, I mean, maybe because I'm not a part of the queer community, I don't have the sort of um, uh, the talented um, inner deep investigative searching that you do to find the drag shows. Like, I just do a generic Google search and it's like, oh, there's a drag brunch in late April. That's the only thing that I found, Andrew. But you're just like, no, 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 no. Let, let me do some digging. And, and you found this place and we went in <laughs> a little after eight when we were done with dinner. We were told that the show on the flyer that they advertised online that the show would start at eight and then we were told uh, that actually the show started at 11 30 so we proceeded to uh, wait three hours at the bar thankfully we had drinks we were talking we were having a good time um and uh, you know <laughs> can i say it was worth the wait <laughs> it's it, it's it's a weird thing where like
like I was let down by the drag show, but I enjoyed our three hour drinks and conversation enough where I didn't think it was a complete waste of time. Does that make sense? That makes 100 percent sense. Um, It really does. I will tell you this, that I enjoyed our conversation. I enjoyed hanging out the bar, having the drinks that we have. I knew (laughs) as a gay person. (laughs) As soon as y'all said the drag show starts at eight, I was like, this drag show is not start- starting at eight. I knew it as soon as y'all said it. But I was like, let's still go to the bar because maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised. This is a whole nother state. I have never been to Connecticut, but other drag shows, everyone that I've been to, they never start before 11. So we got there and I'm like, it looks nice. Like this is a cute little spot. Um, The bar itself was amazing. If you love gay bars, this is going to be like your gay dive, but classy dive bar is how I would like say it. If you're into drag shows, the RuPaul Drag Race girls go there. Um, I saw just Tatiana and Morgan McMichaels and Amethyst for three of the girls who are going to be there within the next three months. So if you get a chance to check out Shea Est, I would say check it out. It's probably really fun on those nights. Um, as far as this night, I myself did not care for the show. And, um, the, th- and the thing is, uh, uh, and, and I apologize for interrupting. I'm just going to do it very briefly. Um, in my peripheral vision, I could sense that. Like you were right behind me. I was standing up watching the drag show and you were sitting in a stool right behind me. And I could feel it because I think you, there, there, there may have been points where you were on your phone or whatever. I mean, the energy that you had at the drag show that I saw in your area of Rochester, New York, versus the energy that you had at this drag show. It was like, oh, yeah, this is not a spectacular drag show by Andrew standards. It's the performers got up there and they performed. The performers got up there and performed. It was great. Um, Myself and maybe it's just me getting older at this point in my life. I'm not a fan of the woo girls. And if you've been to a bar, you know what a woo girl is. It's these girls who come in. Sometimes they're straight. Sometimes they're not. But they're at the drag show. And these girls happen to be straight and brought their boyfriends with them. And they're in the corner and every two seconds, all you hear is what? and just loud screaming for no reason for no reason like yeah they're screaming like we're in the middle of an amusement park and i'm like what are you screaming for it's just somebody walking out on stage saying hello and you could tell the performers were a little irritated with this group of people because one they were touching the drag queens when they said do not touch us and two they were the people who do the things with the money like put it in their bra or put it in their mouth and the performers like i'm not on that vibe for this performance and they kept doing that so that kind of irritated me while i was sitting there and then i picked up my phone to try to take a video and i took like two videos and i was like this is just not for me i was not in the vibe for the show i actually wish they would have stopped performing and we could have just gone back to talking that was far more fun for me than the actual show itself um and then all the performers i mean y'all got up there and y'all performed your asses off but the layout of that bar didn't work for what the songs were that they were doing because that halfway through each performer Former, I couldn't see them on the television or in the crowd because there was just too many people around. Okay. Can you uh, describe further the layout and how it affects a drag show? So this bar, it's a rectangular room. So it's a rectangular room. The stage for the drag performers are in the center of the longest side of this rectangle. And the bar is facing the stage. So you've got this big bar, this big stage, and you have maybe about, I would say, a six foot clearance between the two. And there's tables and chairs set up in between all of that. So it's a pretty crowded space. And then when you pack it with people, unfortunately, if the performers get off the stage, you lose them. You can't see where they've gone to. And they have a camera system with TV set up on the wall. But unfortunately, where the camera is on the bar, because it's so close to the stage, the performer will take two steps out of that range and then you can't see them on the television. You can't see them around the people unless you're pushing through people to see. So the layout kind of hurt the performance for some of the girls. Yeah, I agree. That And that was a big thing that I noticed was, um, sure, if the performer is just staying on the stage, that's fine, but I kind of know how drag performing can work. It's pretty similar to the relationship that like, say, a, a stand-up comedian or maybe a, a theater actor who breaks the fourth wall, like the relationship with the audience where you just, you, you want to immerse with them. You may want to go in and visit with them and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, like you said, I mean, once they stepped off the stage, it was like, oh, okay, I guess I have to like really lean my body over to the right to see what's going on. Um, yeah, once they, you know, I, I think exited stage uh, left from 
from their view off the stage, it was just, okay, I'm looking at an empty stage and I'm hearing music and I don't know what's going on, like at the far end of the bar that I can't see. Um, so that played a role in the show not being great. I mean, personally, I thought, and, and again, this is comparing to the only other drag show that I've seen, and that's the one that you took me to in, in your in your town of Rochester. Um, I thought that the, what can I call it? Uh, the sort of uh, physical theatrics that I saw in the Rochester drag show that I found to be so compelling, I didn't see too much of that with this drag show. I felt like it was very limited. I thought that the Toy Story theme was nice. I thought that, you know, some of the, you know, people dressing up as Toy Story characters, that's unique. I've never seen that before. But um, the physical and lip syncing theatrics that can make a drag show pop, in my opinion, um, again, comparing it from the Rochester show, I just felt like, oh, this one didn't have as much. And it went by super fast. Uh, the, this, this show was at 1130. The next show was at 1230. Like, how, how long was this show that we saw at 1130? Like 15 minutes or something? I think it was about 15 to 20 ish minutes. Yeah, it just went by really fast and I just was expecting a lot more um, animation from the performances that I didn't get. And maybe that came from the fact that we were waiting three hours. And when you wait that long for a drag show, maybe your expectations are like super high, like, OK, this better be worth the wait. Um, now, you know, Courtney, our friend uh, who came along with us, I think she, this was her first legit drag show experience. So I think she like genuinely liked it. And, you know, mm. let her have that experience like that. Everybody needs to have their positive intro drag experience but i was just like keeping the cynicism in my head i was like oh god yeah that wasn't that wasn't great that we, we, we could have gotten so much better it's to anybody who's been out to a drag show before in the past you know drag shows vary they're very different some performers are very high energy some are not as high energy with the theatrics and there's different things the performers themselves did really well they did well they entertained the crowd and they played in the space that they had the thing that I didn't enjoy was that the one, the Toy Story theme was great, but there were points where each performer's performance had a talking section like spoken word and you couldn't hear it. So since you couldn't hear it, you lost that portion of the movie that they're trying to channel. Because like mm -hmm. we had uh, the girl, Woody, Woody's daughter, I forgot what her, her name is. She was one of them. Then we had little Bo Peep. Then we had the kid who was like destroying all of his toys. And oh, I forgot what the other performer was from Toy Story. I'm very sorry. Please forgive me, Queen. That is not intentional that I don't remember you. It's just that I don't remember what she had on. Out of all the performers, Little Bo Peep was the one who did the best. She was mm -hmm. amazing. She stole the show because she engaged the crowd and stuff. And even those yeah. moments where there was the talking portion and you couldn't hear the track, she still interacted and made it like good. The other queens, when those talking sections came on, because they knew that nobody in the crowd could hear and they couldn't hear it themselves, they just stopped stopped lip syncing altogether. They didn't move their mouths at all. And it's like, but there's something coming through the speaker. You should be moving your mouth. Or if you're not moving your mouth, you should be acting it out and not just collecting your tips. And that's mm. what was happening. So I was like, okay, I kind of feel a little let down that some of these performers didn't stay in the performance mindset the whole entire time. Um, I mean, I've never gone up and performed in drag myself, but I know at a drag show, there are people out there who work for the bar or come with you as the performer who will make sure that your tips get collected. So to just stop lip syncing altogether. I was like, this kind of takes me out of the illusion of the show at this point. It's interesting that you say that. I didn't pick up on the the performer stopping the lip syncing at some point. All I kept thinking was the spoken word part of it seems badly placed for the environment that the drag show was in. Like going back to that annoying crowd, uh, you know, with the, I guess, I think the straight woman like sitting on her boyfriend's lap and the friends and they're all like, woo! Like that seemed to be the crowd environment and when you have that kind of energy, it's very easy for something like a spoken word thing to be drowned out. I was paying attention to it. I know that th that group and maybe other people weren't paying attention to it. So all I kept thinking was like, oh, if this was like a more formalized theater setting where uh, maybe the woos wouldn't make sense as much, like literally like take this drag show to like a Broadway theater, um, then I feel like the lip syncing spoken word part would have made sense. Um, other than that, I feel like, you know, the lip syncing 
part where you're singing a song like that seems like it would have just fit that 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 crowd that was very woo 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 woo. Um, going back to the to that annoying crowd that you mentioned, uh, they reminded me of like isn't there like a phenomenon of like groups of uh, straight women who have this energy going to drag shows? <laughs> yeah, are you saying are you, are you saying you're annoyed from that crowd? I am, and this is not just me. You can go on TikTok, YouTube, all kinds of stuff. One of them, look up, look up, drag queen pushes woman during all. I want for Christmas. And there is this thing that some, not everybody, but some people do when they go to a drag show who maybe are not familiar with drag show etiquette, who will get on stage where the performer is, who will try to touch the performer, who will grab the performer, who will try to grope the performer. And these are things you should not be doing at a drag show. And typically they end up being the woo girls, those girls who come in behaving just like that. And I don't know if you picked up on it when the host first came out and was introducing everything for the show and then was like, oh, whose first time is it here at a drag show? And the one girl who's sitting on her boyfriend's lap starts screaming and it's like, this is my boyfriend. And, da, da, da. and then the uh, host was going to bring him up on stage. But then when she walked over, the girlfriend started grabbing on the host and she was like, nope, I'm not going to go to you guys. So she walks away. And that's when she went to the other side of the stage and was like, oh, it's your first time in a drag show. And that's when she started focusing on them. And and it's that energy that that group had that it's like, OK, I get you're happy. Be happy and celebrate. But you got to be respectful of the performers. And they yeah. weren't. Wow. I didn't even pick up on that specific moment. Wow. OK, that's 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 very good looking out. Oh, wow. So um, and and speaking of which, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, on on the uh, on, on the drag show topic, I think a big part of our uh, conversation with you, me and Courtney at the bar while we were waiting for the show that I enjoyed was, um, uh, you know, we, 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 you, since you're the person that, you know, is represented of the uh, of the queer community we were like you know trying to see like oh where can we find like a good drag community and i think we were <laughs> naming all the countries and the states like oh alaska yay maybe russia definitely not like it was just fun having that conversation it was it was fun having that conversation and if you're listening and you know where good shows are in your community post them let's create a thread of like great places to go for drag shows because they're out there drag queens are everywhere they're just like gay people Gay people exist everywhere. We will never be gone, ever. So they're everywhere. South Dakota? They're there. Even with the, what do they have, bears up there or something? They got some kind of crazy stuff in South Dakota. Uh, But you said Egypt? No, because I think Egypt, it's literally illegal to be gay in Egypt. It is, but I'm pretty sure the gay community there is just underground. So even my people in Egypt, I'm sending you hearts. Be safe there, because I imagine it is crazy. Did you see the hearts (laughs) pop up on your Zoom? I did. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's always worth it to have a, a, a drag show night out. Um, I, I just hope we have a, a much better one with hopefully a more respectful audience. And um, I, I mean, I will always be down to go to your home in Rochester to see another one because the one that I saw was fantastic. Um, and you claim that, you know, where I am in the Burlington area here in Vermont, there's got to be a drag community somewhere. So when you come up here, I look forward to seeing that. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a rewatch podcast slash drag show tour sometime. Ooh, I would like that. The delicious recap tour. We're going to the drag shows. That would be a goal. That is, no, I'm serious. That is a goal. Like, if we get big enough as a podcast, I want to do live performances like around the country. And man, if if we could be the first rewatch podcast to have a uh, rewatch podcast drag show hybrid, oh, that would be great because it's like combining, like, oh yeah, like your you know your childhood comfort food, yada, yada, yada. But we're also acknowledging that like, hey, like here's the present. Here's the modern world where things like drag shows, fortunately, are more in the upfront and it's not seen as such a taboo thing anymore. It's like it's it's both a nostalgic and inclusive events that that I would like to see. I would like that because drag is art. Drag is important. It's art and laws in this country are trying to make drag illegal, which is really targeting trans people. But there are laws, especially in Florida, that are starting to impede people's rights just to perform in drag. So I am down for supporting the entire community. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful community. Um, and thank you, you know, for, for you listening to our uh, 90s con recap, our drag show recap. We uh, want to go to another 90s con. We definitely want to see more drag shows in the future. And as always, our socials at Family Matters Rewatch Pod for the moment <laughs> on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, we are going to
going to be having a rebrand at some point. So we'll lean more on the delicious recap side of things when we get there. And how can people follow you, Andrew? You can follow me on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And also Twitter now at H.A. Vandertunt. Yeah, I signed up for a cute little Twitter. I still don't know how to use it. I know that it's blue and I know that there's a lot of people on there. So I'll explore and play with it more. Okay, well, first of all, that's X, formerly known as Twitter to you. Uh, but also, <laughs> why did you join Twitter? I mean, uh, isn't it still the toxic wasteland that it, at ho- it has always been? It is, but I have found out one thing as I'm going through this social media journey. If you need to learn how to use search engine options, learn how to use hashtags properly, download Twitter and just look at the search page and you'll understand how these things are used a lot better because I have not known how to use hashtags for the longest time. And now it makes so much more sense reading tweet with them in them. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I will say for a brief time in my radio career that I'm about to wrap up as we are recording this, um, that like um, for radio topics, like Twitter has always been great for, you know, giving me like a list of trending hashtags. And then I just kind of go off of that. Um, So it could be great for certain things. But if you want to, uh, you know, find positive people, (laughs) it could be a challenge sometimes. Yeah. So from what I'm gathering, Twitter is all negativity and porn. So (laughs) you've got a lot to go there and news international news so you can see porn international news and toxic comments from people yeah right what a, what a great triage um the, the new <laughs> part i know the, so i mean i think almost since the inception of twitter like news people journalism people like tweeting that is a great way for them to uh, convey whatever the, it is they want to report because it's you know up to the moment you could type in a line about what's going on you could reference an article so i think even though gradually there There's some journalism outlets that are backing away from the Elon Musk-esque X as we now know it. I think there are still some news outlets that that use Twitter as a way to like report breaking news. So, yeah, I I, I would love to learn about uh, news from Britain, uh, learn why Blizzo is a a, a fat slut, apparently. And also, what was the other thing about Twitter that's that's terrible? Oh, well, the positive is porn. Be a little porn. Yeah. And also get porn from there, even though there's more appropriate places to get porn. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's all I'm figuring out right now. I still have to learn how to use the thing. So once I learn it, maybe there'll just be more. But that's all that has popped up on my timeline is news, weird comments and bad comments and like the little social media stuff and then porn. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess this is what we've got for right now. And as I learn to use Twitter, I will learn it better. Um, It is an Elon Musk product at this point, so I don't have high hopes. But it's something. All right. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. All right. um, As we are recording this again, uh, you know, some inclement weather uh, already in place in Rochester. You said that the the snow is just coming down uh, over there in upstate New York. Um, Some heavy snow expected here in Vermont. So uh, stay safe. I know you are door dashing uh, the heck out of the day as much as you can. Um, I am going to be Instacarting and door dashing as much as possible tonight since I was able to get out of uh, working tomorrow because I live an hour away from work. And I was like, nah, fuck. It. I, I think I would rather live than risk my life going to a job that I'm about to leave in a few days. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, stay safe and we will uh, talk to each other again soon. Yes, I will talk to you soon. Yes. Uh, do you mind signing us off? Good, sir. Um, I will sign us off because 90 Con was delicious. So we'll let the deliciousness ring. Oh.